begrüße Dr. Kieran Bond. I constructed a 3D Ultimate Lift about four years ago and constructed a 2.9 Lift exclusively for Redensity 2 about two and a half years ago. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how we try to make the live demonstration as realistic as possible, uh, mimicking the kind of situations that you and I uh, face on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in our practice. So, let's get started. There is a lot to cover today, and I will try to squeeze everything into half an hour. But very importantly, I need your attention, because the presentation has been constructed in such a way that it flows from the start to the end, and each slide is related to the slide before an advanced procedure. I'm going to have to make some assumptions as part of this presentation that you have familiarity when it comes to the use of microcannula, and I use microcannula exclusively for this particular procedure. And then, the assumption I made is that you have considerable experience in the use of hyaluronic acid dermal filler, and you are considerably familiar with the three-dimensional anatomy. What is 3D Ultimate Lift? I mentioned very briefly that 3D Ultimate Lift encompasses treatment in the entire face. I practice in the part of the United Kingdom that I don't have the luxury of patients having huge disposable income. I don't have the luxury of five syringes of different types of dermal fillers, radio frequency, uh, laser resurfacing, all sorts of modalities in order to give our patients the best result. I practice in a part of the United Kingdom that my patients expect a lot for the money they spent. Therefore, my techniques have been constructed in such a way that I aim to give my patients as good a result as possible and represent the best value as possible for them. So that's number one. Number two, the procedure that's been constructed, it's taken into consideration as minimal a side effects as possible. I want to be able to let my patients go back to work immediately after the procedure. And number three, it is a procedure that has to yield the most natural result that is age about 3D Ultimate Lift, let's move on to 2-point eye lift. Why is it called 2-point eye lift? Again, it encompasses only two entry points, taking into consideration the traditional techniques of using hypodermic needles give you a whole catalogue of side effects. And also, this part of the face, it comes with other side effects as a result of poor choices of dermal fillers. So, 2-point eye lift has been constructed in such a way all of these have been taken into consideration. Let's talk about the fat compartments. Dr. Redcar went into it very extensively this morning. I'm just going to set the scene by going through it very briefly. So I require a little bit of your imagination and a lot of your attention. This is the superficial fat compartment. We peel the skin away. It's like an apron. It drapes all over the entire face, and this is the deep fat compartment. And I would like you to commit that into your memory for now, because I'm going to go through it in greater detail. Let's talk about what changes as part of the aging process. Aging process, our face is like a deflating balloon. You gradually soak air out of the balloon, and you're left with the flabby bits. However, if you look at the left side of the slide, that's a younger woman, and the right side of the the, the slide, there are three changes to focus on. Number one is the resorption of bone, so the bones are thinner. Second, if you focus on the infra, the, the orbit, there are two changes there. One, the orbit changes from oval to rhomboidal, and second, there is flattening of infra or uh, infra orbit. By having the awareness that when we age, the skin thins out, the muscles thin out, the fat disappears in the orbital region and there is bone resorption. However, the concept to remember for this particular slide is the dissociation of the orbicularis oculi muscle, and I believe that's something that hasn't been mentioned today. As part of the aging process, there is dissociation of the orbicularis oculi muscle, and dissociation means splitting. 
of the orbicularis oculi muscle. Why is it important for us to be aware of it, especially in older? The next slide is very important. We've seen this on some of Tioxan's brochure. But what's even more important to keep in mind that's not in the brochure is the presence of these two structures. Ah, yes. Oh, oh. oh. very good. Great, yeah. right, this is Lisa. This is Lisa is 47 years old. Um, what I'm going to do is, as you can see, she hasn't lost a lot of volume, but she could do with a little bit of sculpting and contouring just to rejuvenate uh, her face a little bit. And so I'm going to go through the, the entry points as well as the landmarks. And you probably remember that I talked about that I used the tragus as well as the, the latrine. Are you, you okay now? So I was saying that I'm just going to assume that Lisa doesn't have a lot of disposable income and it's something that we face on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't always get to do everything we want to do for our patients. She would certainly benefit from the two-point eye lift, but like I said, I'm just going to assume that we're going to do only the 3D ultimate lift. So I draw a line here to account for the mid-cheek groove as well as the tear trough. And it's not uncommon, I draw a little triangle here and here as well. And my entry point, I palpate for the infraorbital floor. We talked about the fact that it's important to do that because you have the orbital septum and the orbital malar ligament. And this is my entry point. Because I'm going to sculpt this part of the lower one third of the face with a 23 gauge cannula, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give her a little bit of anesthesia as well, and I'll show you, assuming Lisa is very anxious. And again, a 27 gauge microcannula with lidocaine and some adrenaline. Let's lift your chin up for me. Chin up for me. Good. And to your left. Excellent. A little bit of prodding and tugging. And I'm going to squish one squish of the anesthetic. This is superficial fat compartment, a gentle pressure on the plunger. And I'll come back and do a little bit more. Subdermal, a little bit of prodding and tugging. Right into the oral commissure. And I'm very aware of the fact that I don't have a lot of filler left. Let's sit Lisa forward and let's have a look. Very nice result, yes. Thank you. lift of the face, softening of the nasal labial fold, and there is lifting of the infraorbital. They are all about viscosity. So if it's a very viscous product, it's not safe to be injected into the nasal labial fold and the infraorbital floor because that will give you lumpiness, inflammatory change, a lot of erythema, and a lot of edema. So this part of the face, we don't want that. With ultimate, especially with really good familiarity of the behavior and personality of ultimate, you can inject very, very little product just under the orbicularis oculi muscle with very accurate control of the plunger. It will give you the lift. It will give you the slight hydrophilic property of ultimate without the edema. But that's on the basis that you get under the orbicularis oculi muscle, the patient doesn't have dissociation of orbicularis oculi, and you don't over-inject. Remember, as part of the aging process, we, the two things change in the orbit. First is the flattening of the orbital floor. Second is the widening of the orbit. So a procedure, for a procedure to be thorough and to give good results, we have to account for these, these two. And what I forgot to mention is Irit lost 20 kilograms over the past 12 months. So she will have lost a lot of volume in her face and predominantly in the infraorbital region. And we want to take that into consideration. So palpate for the mid-cheek groove and the tear drop. Pinch the skin. And this is a 25 gauge entry needle. One, two, and three. Not too deep because we don't want to give her any bruising. This is a 27 gauge one and a half inch cannula. And I've got redensity to bevel up. Pinch the skin to anchor it. In it goes. Sit her forward.
as you can see, she's hardly bled. Let's sit her forward and let's have a look. Okay, relax. Okay, relax. take away the plunger and I take away the finger range and I mount this one into the DTO cell pen nice and quick and I've got the body of the pen like that and I attach the cannula so it's very quick then you switch on there are three different colors, three different speeds for two different modes, linear threading and boluses. I'm going to switch, and for those who ski, and a lot of Germans do, it's coded according to the ski slope. Green is baby slope, blue is um, intermediate, and then red is challenging. There is no black, unfortunately. So I'm just going to anchor. There is an engagement rod, as you can see, is advancing toward the plunger. It doesn't take a long time, to be honest. Okay. There you are. So the bevel is primed. Although you use a gadget, but it doesn't mean that the two-point eyelid technique changes. It doesn't. So, let's see. Two things we want to correct. We want to correct the tear trough and the mid-cheek groove. Second, the flattening of the infraorbital floor. So, better than that. To keep it nice and safe and you rely on the contour of the orbicularis oculi to give you that smoothness. So I'm lifting it, you can't see the bevel, as you can see. Okay, now I'm going to switch the mode to medium. 27 gauge cannula, the same cannula as the one I used. Press the activation button and gently withdraw. You get this smooth, homogeneous control of deposit of filler. One more time. So keep it to the same plane. Yeah, very good. Very nice result. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's a two point island.